Good morning. This is Joey Cohen, InStone's Marketing Coordinator. I would like to welcome everyone to InStone's Winter Webinar Series. Today's webinar is the training version of Advanced Building Products Designing and Detailing Exterior Wall for Moisture Control. Before I go and introduce today's presenter, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Due to the amount of attendees we have on today's webinar, everyone's lines will be placed on mute. If you have a question during the webinar, please either use the raise your hand or ask a question function or enter the question in the chat section of the GoToWebinar control panel on the lower right of your screen. We will try to answer all the questions at the end of the webinar, but in case we do not get to everyone's question, we will follow up with, with you individually. And now without any further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter and switch to his screen now. Here is the Vice President of Advanced Building Products, Mr. Keith Lally. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Joey. We appreciate the opportunity this morning to talk with you and with all of your customers that are on the line today. What we want to speak about basically is designing and detailing walls for moisture control, as you can see. Um, Joey, first of all, just before we go any further, you guys can see my screen, correct? It did not load up yet. Do you see it right now? Yes. Okay, great. I want to make sure. Advanced Building Products is a, is a leading manufacturer of basically moisture protection products. We got our start over 25 years ago making copper laminated flashings. And in 2007, we actually expanded and now started making entangled net products for mortar deflections, rain screens, drainage mats, and other industries as well. Basically, everything that we're going to talk about today in this presentation, all of these products and systems are available through Endstone. So if any of you on the, on the line today have any questions about these products, please speak to a, a sales representative from InStone, or you can definitely call here at Advanced Building Products, and we can answer any technical questions that you might have. What we're going to do today is basically go over the components and functions of various wall designs. We're going to start with residential applications, and then we're going to end the presentation with commercial cavity wall applications. The main point with the residential side is we want to talk about the functions of rain screen products and the role that they play in creating a healthy wall. We're going to talk about different types of rain screens that are on the market today, um, the entangled nets versus some of the other ones. And then the last thing that we're going to touch on briefly are building code changes and changes that we see coming in the future. When it comes to exterior walls, there are really two types of walls, ones that absorb moisture and ones that don't. Um, all you know, non-absorbative claddings, absorbative claddings. Your non-absorbatives are your metals, your glass, your vinyl, your composite sidings. Now keep in mind that these types of sidings aren't going to allow moisture in. However, the sealants and the joints and different expansion areas will allow moisture past these points. Absorbative claddings are more like the woods, fiber cements, the stone, stucco, brick, and adhered veneers that are getting a lot of popularity right now. When you think of moisture, you obviously think of rain, snow, and wind. We're sitting right here in southern Maine. We've got 48 inches of snow in the last eight days. So the snow part is definitely hitting home with us right now. Some of the things people don't think about, though, are man-made sources of moisture. A good example is an account we had in Arizona one time had a nice residential home with all kinds of moisture problems. And they called me up and said, Keith, we can't figure this out. Why are we having moisture problems? It doesn't rain here. What they didn't realize is when they went to work, their new irrigation system that was put in was put in incorrectly, and water was shooting at their wall for a few hours every day. And after a while, that just builds up, and you have some moisture issues. You've got the scientific reasons as well, the solar drive, you know, capillary movement, your, your condensation, things of that nature. Solar drive in particular is interesting because you can have moisture problems happening in your wall on a sunny day. You know, solar energy evaporates moisture, but it also pushes vapor inwards. And when that vapor is pushed within a wall system, it actually can condense into a liquid state, and now you've got moisture within your wall. So it's not always just about where it rains and where it snows the most. It, moisture problems happen anywhere. When you have a crack in your wall, especially when it comes to masonry, since it's a porous substance, the smaller the crack, 
the more likely it is to have capillary movement of moisture into that crack. A good example of capillary action or capillary movement is basically when, when we were younger, we'd go to the doctor and they'd basically you know, prick your finger to take a blood sample. What they would do is they'd put a little glass tube over you know, where they, they punctured your skin and the blood would basically be drawn up into the tube. That's capillary action. That is very similar to what happens in a wall. When you have a little crack but you have moisture present, it draws that moisture into the wall system. The key is when that moisture gets through that wall system, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to get it out? In the very beginning, you don't know you have a moisture issue. I mean, it takes a lot for it to become relevant and, and noticeable. But when you do have moisture in a wall, you're going to see mold. Um, poor indoor air quality could happen. You're going to have to increase the maintenance of your building. And basically, as you know, once moisture is in the wall and not taken care of, it's going to decrease the lifespan of the building structure. Now, some of these pictures here that you see are obviously obvious um, examples of moisture issues. You know, this, this uh, white chalky substance you see here, it's called efflorescence. It's a salt-like substance that's caused by moisture that's within the wall trying to work its way out and it's bringing the salts and the acids and the alkalis and the mortar basically out through the wall with it. One of the big things with especially commercial applications is corrosion of building materials. When you have a lot of wall reinforcing, you want to keep that as dry as possible. You don't want that to be in constant contact with moisture. Um, cracking, spalling, you know, things of that nature you see. Interior deterioration of finishes. This picture here on the right, a lot of times buildings can have moisture issues and you don't know because you have wallpaper covering up. Or you may have a darker paint on the wall so you don't see it at first. But it doesn't mean it's not there. From a commercial standpoint, we design with cavity wall applications. Cavity wall applications basically have an airspace because keep in mind, there's no such thing as a waterproof wall system. So moisture is always going to find its way in. Cavity wall applications basically build with a void space or a cavity to allow that moisture to drain down and out. Now there are numerous components to a cavity wall system that we're going to get into later in the presentation. But when you look at a system like this designed for moisture penetration, what do you do when it comes to a residential application that doesn't have this airspace? You're still going to have moisture coming through the wall. If it doesn't have a place to drain down, it's going to stay. And if it stays over time, it might be able to work its way into the inner wall system. A good example of that is house wraps. How many jobs have you been on where you go by and you see the house wrap blowing in the wind? I mean, in a perfect world, you're going to have those seams nice and taped, but a lot of times that's not realistic, and those house wraps aren't perfectly seamed. If they're not perfectly seamed and you have moisture that's trapped, eventually it's going to get behind that house wrap. Once it's behind that house wrap, it's going to eventually work its way into the inner wall system. Here's a typical construction of a, a residential application. You see your, your WRB right here, and your siding goes right on top of the WRB. When that happens, you've got punctures from the nails that are putting your siding in place, which is fine. But as you can see here, moisture has a place to stay, has a place to be standing moisture, as they call it. Easy access for this moisture to work its way into the wall system. When that happens, now this is a pretty severe photograph. Unfortunately, there are many of them out there that are similar to this. If it doesn't have a place to go, it'll, it'll work its way into the wall system. This is extremely expensive to fix, as you all can, can imagine. This particular house right here was in Pennsylvania. The cladding had to be replaced. The weather-resistant barrier obviously had to be replaced. Window flashings had to be replaced. Sheathing, the framing, which is real expensive. And obviously, this insulation is saturated, so the R value of this house has really been compromised. Repair costs of something like this could be very minimal at $10,000. It can exceed $300,000. This particular house was about $89,000 to fix. The problem with that is a lot of homeowners insurance nowadays have a cap of $5,000 on homeowners insurance when it comes to mold, rot, fungus, things of that nature. This slide right here is just a blown up example of a typical homeowners insurance policy. Now, $5,000, that's not going to cover ripping the stuff off the house, let alone buying the materials, the labor, and the time to build back up. Not to mention, 
in a house like this, the family's going to have to be relocated while this is all being done. Fiber cement we talked about is one of the, the, the widely used products right now. Fiber cement is, in New England, used all over the place, in most of the country. The thing you've got to be careful of with fiber cement is if the nail gun pressure is set too high, it could actually blow out the back of the board. This is an example of a house where that is exactly what happened. You can see right here, this is actually the back. The nail went through and basically just kind of cracked and ripped out a portion of this. When moisture gets behind this cement board, it basically will allow the moisture to absorb right into the board. The first signs that you have this happening will be peeling of the paint. Um, this can get bad enough that your siding literally can be pulled off the house and crumpled up into a ball because it's so wet, so saturated. Um, about 2002, I built a house using fiber cement, and unfortunately, I can tell you firsthand that does happen because it actually happened to me in a couple locations. When you're building a non-cavity wall structure, there are basically three ways to build these walls. You've got direct, vented, and ventilated. Direct is just like the picture you recently saw where they take that siding and they put it right up on the sheathing with a house wrap. Ventilated is very similar to a cavity wall application where there's, the wall is built to allow drainage at the bottom of the wall. That's better than direct, obviously. But what we really are aiming for is to have a ventilated wall. Now, what a ventilated wall is, is it's designed so that not only do you have drainage at the bottom of the wall, but you have ventilation so that air can be entered into that wall system and go from the bottom, rise to the top, and be out of certain like vents that are created to allow a convective airflow. This is basically what gets us into you know, what is a rain screen and a rain screen's function. You've got positive and negative pressure, obviously, on any building. The key is you want the pressure on the outside of the building to be as close to equal with the pressure within the wall system. Now, it's impossible to have pressure equalization. If you have a windy day and the wind's blowing, let's say, 30, 35 miles an hour, it's not blowing 30 or 35 miles an hour all day long. You're going to have gusts or bursts of wind. It's going to change direction. It's going to change speed. It's going to change pressure. So what you want to do is have an airspace within your wall system that's going to allow enough air in to equalize or moderate the pressure. Because what happens if you have a big difference between your outside air pressure and your inside air pressure, it's going to allow excess moisture to be drawn into the wall system, which is going to obviously, if you don't have any drainage components, it's going to allow for moisture issues. Now, in commercial applications, which we'll get into, the theory was, okay, build this airspace wide. From a residential standpoint, A, it's not economical, and it's not practical. And the reason I say that is you want that airspace to be as narrow as possible but still be able to function properly because the wider the airspace, the more air you need to let into that wall system. The more air you let into that wall system, moisture travels in air. You're allowing moisture into the wall. It also takes longer for the pressure between the outside and the inside to neutralize. We recommend, and so does the industry, that you go anywhere from a 6 millimeter to a 10 millimeter gap. That allows, number one, the pressure to neutralize quicker in the wall system. It doesn't allow as much moisture to be brought into the wall system. And even more so, it doesn't mean that you have to have certain structural reinforcing wall ties, things of that nature in order to put your siding up against this residential application. So again, the functions of a rain screen are to ventilate the wall. You need to have openings at the top and the bottom. You will not have a true rain screen application if you do not have convective airflow and convective ventilation. A lot of people think to take care of moisture, you need to be, it's all about drainage. It's all about getting the water out. It is, but it's also about ventilation. And ventilation is as important as drainage when it comes to engineered rain screens or engineered uh, rain screen wall systems. So keep that in mind. Here's an example of a job that we were involved with. This is in Long Island. The top picture that you see here, this wall had some moisture issues. As you can see, this is efflorescence. Okay? What we did is we put these vents at the top of the wall 
along with the vents that were already installed on top of flashing at the bottom of the wall. By allowing this air into the wall system, it actually took the residual moisture, the excess moisture, and dried and ventilated. There was no cleaning agent, no Prosoco, no, no Dietrich, any cleaning agent used on this wall system. By incorporating vents at the top and the bottom, the actual convective airflow actually dried out that wall, allowing the efflorescence to dissipate. So when it comes to residential applications, how do you create this airspace? Um, you need to have a fixed airspace, as we mentioned. You need to drain and ventilate the wall. It moderates air pressure and provides a capillary break. We're going to get into capillary break in a second because there's a difference between a one millimeter, a three millimeter, a six millimeter. Not all capillary breaks are equal. But as you can see, it allows drainage coming down. It allows that ventilation coming up. In the past, you'd have a traditional way of creating an airspace throughout this, this residential structure or non-cavity wall structure. They were called furring strips. They're still used today quite often. There are other alternatives in the market that are better, however. A, a product like this, um, it lacks cross ventilation. As you can see, this is wood. Usually it's every 16 inches on center. It doesn't allow cross ventilation. This wood is going to be in contact with the siding on average, that's about 15% of the wall surface area is going to have siding to wood contact. That's an opportunity for moisture to, to be stuck within the wall system. If you're using a wood, it could possibly decay over time. Um, there are other non-wood products that are being used that obviously don't have that problem. It is a little bit more labor intensive compared to newer alternatives that are on the market today as well. Engineered rain screens. This is a term that you're all probably familiar with, and if not, you will be in the very near future. There are a few different types of engineered rain screens. This one that you see right here is considered a dimpled mat. Uh, a very, very good product. It drains, it ventilates on both sides. It's a costly product, but you'll see this used a lot for below grade waterproofing. You're now starting to see it being used as a rain screen as well. A product that you're probably fairly familiar with is a geotextile entangled net matrix type product. These products are, are, there are a lot of advantages to using this type of product over others on the market, which we're going to get into shortly. You want to be mindful though, these products come two ways, with or without a heat bonded filter fabric on the product. If you're doing a, a job that has stucco, manufactured stone, or masonry, we recommend you use a product that has a heat bonded filter fabric on it. This is a jar right here that I believe is going to use manufactured stone, but as you can see, they had to use a layer of grade D paper, then they put the mesh over it. That's additional labor, it's additional product costs. A product like this, which we have a product called Mortar Vent, it has a heat bonded filter fabric. It comes in two thicknesses for residential applications. You have a channel design right here, and this is called our waffle design. This is a six millimeter, this is a 10 millimeter. Six millimeter is basically what's used in the US. 10 millimeter was created because that's code in Canada. When it comes to mortar vent, the nice thing about the product is it's a one skew item. Now this product mortar vent InStone has this in stock, so they, they are our distributor in, in your area for this type of product. But you can use it with stucco, manufactured stone, wood, cedar, it's one skew. You don't need an insect screen, <clears throat> you don't need to have you know, different components to go with different applications. It's a one product does it all. The nice thing about these products is they come with a fabric flap, as you can see right here right here. That fabric flap is an insect screen. So at the base of the wall, when you're actually creating an airspace, you want to make sure you have something to protect bugs and things of that nature so they can't get up into that airspace and build a nest. So that's another nice advantage of using the mortar vent product line is it's all built in. Everything that you need is built into this one product. When you're using an entangled matrix, whether it be ours or, or another manufacturer, 
they are all mold and mildew resistant. The drainage of these products is multi-directional. <clears throat> what I mean by that basically is if you go back, there's no such thing as a guaranteed square wall. You're going to have to cut and patch at, at different areas. You can't install this incorrectly. You've got this open weave design, so moisture is going to drain down this way. It's also going to drain if you put it the other way. There are some products on the market that are a corrugated plastic, and I've been on a lot of job sites where they originally put it out so that the channels were going down uh, vertical, which was great. But then they got to parts of the wall where they had to cut and paste and patch, and somebody installed these channels vertical, I mean horizontally, and the water basically stayed trapped in the wall system. So it's very important that if you're going to pick a rain screen and use a rain screen, you really want to go with an entangled matrix because it does have multi-directional drainage. These products do not crack to the point of failure when bent and manipulated. These are very cost-effective products. Um, an installed cost to an end user is roughly around a dollar a square foot. So remember that slide I just told you guys about the $5,000 house insurance, um, homeowner's insurance, I should say. This would cost a homeowner somewhere between maybe like $2,000, $2,500, depending on the square footage of their house. Our mortar vent product comes with a 50-year warranty. So what we tell a lot of homeowners, a lot of distributors, a lot of architects, is it's relatively cheap homeowner's insurance to use this product. And when we kind of lay it out that way, it, it's a very easy sell for our distributors when they're talking to their customers. This product, very important, is no, uh, it's resistant to most chemicals that are on the market. That's very important. With all the new products that are coming out, some things are not compatible with others, which we're going to get into later on in this presentation. It is lead compliant. Our products are made out of recycled contact lenses and soda bottles. Probably the most important thing, though, for all of you when you think about maybe bringing in an engineered rain screen product for your customers, make sure it has a Class A fire rating. This is very important because keep in mind, when you use a rain screen, you're basically creating a cavity wall concept without the cavity wall cost. But more importantly, you're creating airspace from the first floor all the way up to the top. So if you're going to have a fire on the first floor, you do not want to have anything that's going to allow that fire to travel up that wall faster than normal. If you have a Class A fire rating that has been tested, you know that won't happen. Mortar vent, for example, you can light that up and it basically just melts itself out. It does not ignite. It'll just basically fizzle out. That's very important to know when you're putting any kind of product all the way up a wall. The heat bonded filter fabric, as I've already mentioned, very important for stone and stucco applications, but it's also very important when you're doing a cedar or a wood or a fiber cement application. And the reason I say that is from a wood standpoint, the, the filter fabric gives the product shear strength, tensile strength, and compressive strength. If you take an engineered rain screen and you don't have a filter fabric on it, <coughs> excuse me, it stretches. So in other words, you can tack it up on one side of the wall, you can have your contractor roll it out, but you don't have a guaranteed six millimeter thickness anymore. It could be six millimeters in the beginning, it could be stretched out to four, maybe even three. You want to make sure that your rain screen has a guaranteed continuous thickness from one side of the wall to the other. And again, one last time, for inventory control, especially in these times, you don't have to stock multiple products. This one product does any application that you need. Here's a quick little video of how you install mortar vent. You've got your weep screed that is optional, your house wrap. If you install mortar vent right to left, you can't install it wrong. The way that we manufacture our product and the way it comes off our lines is the filter fabric will always be on the right side of the wall, meaning facing out if you install the product from right to left. Keep in mind, if you put the thing upside down, if you want to do it horizontal, vertical, it's always going to work. This bug, uh, bug screen that we spoke about, when you get to your second course, you just shingle it over. Um, you can tuck it back, but you don't have to fold it around, just shingle it over. You only need to fold it at the very base. When you get to the top of the wall, you can actually take this roll and invert it, and then use the fill of fabric for the same concept at the top, so that you've blocked any bugs from getting in the bottom of your wall and also bugs getting in the top of your wall. 
here's a typical stone, solid stone wall detail. When you have any kind of mortar, again, mortar is porous. Over time, you're going to have cracks in this mortar. Moisture is going to be able to find its way in. You need to have a drainage mat here between the insulation and the WRB so that the moisture that gets through this wall over time can drain down and out of the wall effectively. If you don't have a drainage mat, you basically have a barrier wall here. And what's going to happen is that wall is going to be wet, it's going to stay wet, and over time it's going to start breaking down the mortar. When that mortar starts to break down, your stone is stuck in that wall, mostly at the mortar locations, because sometimes there are wall ties and whatnot, but all of a sudden your wall could actually be compromised. So it's very important, you know moisture is going to get into these types of walls, put in a drainage mat so you can allow the moisture out. Here's more of a typical wall with a, with a manufactured stone. You've got your scratch coats, your metal lath, you've got your drainage mat here, you've got your WRB, and then your sheathing. It's important that you have at least a four inch space between your, your grade and your manufactured stone. I'll have people all the time, they'll call me up and say, well, the design is, you know, the, the, the building owner doesn't want to see the foundation, so we're going to take the manufactured stone and we're going to run it below grade. Will your mortar vent be okay? Well, the answer is yes, the mortar vent will be fine. We make a different version of mortar vent for below grade drainage applications. So the mortar vent will be fine, but more importantly, I don't know if the manufactured stone is going to do fine over the years when it's below grade. That's something that they're going to have to check, obviously, with the manufactured stone manufacturer to get their recommendations, but I'm pretty sure they all frown on doing that. It's also important on a residential application to put some kind of a flashing at the bottom just to make sure that that moisture that drains down has the ability to get out of the wall. Uh, this can be done in the form of a lightweight metal flashing like a copper or a stainless steel or oftentimes uh, like an ice and water shield or a peel and stick type application. When it comes to residential construction, there have been changes in most of the new building codes, and there are new changes coming for 2018. Here's just a quick little example of the International Residential Code for 2015, where there's an exception now under Section 703 that basically states that you want to have a non-water absorbing layer or a design drainage space. Now, there's a lot of talk in the industry right now about drainable house wraps versus engineered rain screens. Drainable house wraps and engineered rain screens are not the same thing. A drainable house wrap sometimes will have like a one millimeter space. That's fine for wood applications, but a drainable house wrap doesn't have that protective layer for scratch coats when it comes to a manufactured stone situation, uh, a stucco situation. I've been on a lot of um, residential home failures on the East Coast where they thought they were safe because they used a drainable house wrap. The problem is, once they put the lap up and they put the scratch coat up, that drainable channel was clogged. So it really didn't do anything. I mean, the moisture was stuck there. It got behind the house wrap. You had mold. You had rot issues. You want to make sure that you have a capillary break no less than three millimeters. Um, that's why the industry you'll see has a six millimeter. Well, well, why have six millimeter when you only need three? Because there is a little bit of compression that does take place when you put up any rain screen. Uh, ours, for example, if it's really under a lot of pressure, it might compress from 6 millimeters down to 5.2 or 5.3. So you're still well above that 3 millimeter negative. Also, a 1 millimeter airspace does not give you enough space for proper ventilation. 6 millimeters gives you that proper space for ventilation, and there's been a lot of testing done to prove that. So along with this added change to the 2015 code, the International Residential Code. The same thing was put into the 2015 Building Code, the IBC, basically talking about a drainage space, needing a non-absorbing drainage space. And just to, to answer a question that might come up, the filter fabric on these drainage mats, do they hold water? And the answer is no. Uh, they have been tested. They do get wet, obviously, in the, in the initial contact. But the ventilation that takes place with this type of fabric, it dries the fabric very quickly. So you don't have to worry about basically installing a rain screen wondering if you have a sponge that you just installed all the way up your wall. Uh, that's not the case. 
The 10 millimeter product that we showed you earlier, you know, why, why 10 millimeters? That was basically created in Canada. Uh, back in 2005, Canada had this in their code. This is the most recent edition that I've got, is 2010. They talk about having a capillary break, but in section 9.27.2.2, they actually go a little bit further and say you need to have a 10 millimeter deep or 3 eighths gap or capillary break behind the cladding. Um, the whole way 10 millimeters was determined, if I told you the story, you probably wouldn't believe it because it's kind of ridiculous. But that's what they came up with. That's what they've been using. And the reason Canada was kind of leading the way in this is they had a lot of problems in the Vancouver market with, with condos that were relatively new. A lot of mold, a lot of rot issues, and they couldn't figure out why. And after having a lot of the scientists get involved in ripping the walls apart, it was the lack of drainage and ventilation. The National Association of Home Builders has a bunch of case studies. I mean, I can't tell you how many pages this case study is, but it's all about mold and rot in residential construction. But the kicker is these are all homes that are less than five years old. A lot of people think that moisture issues, oh, that's an older home issue. It's not. It's, it's a newer home issue. A lot of the new building materials that are out there now aren't the same as they were 30 or 40 years ago. Sometimes things were built a lot better back then, but, but technology has, has evolved and so is the way that we build, sometimes not always for the better. So you have to plan for things now that you didn't always have to plan for you know, 30 years ago. This was nice to see with the Masonry Veneer Manufacturers Association. They've got installation guides, as you're probably aware of. They do make reference in their third edition about building with a rain screen or a drainage mat, basically talking about how it can create a space and it can allow drainage and ventilation. Um, way back, when I say way back, probably like five, six, seven years ago, I would speak with a lot of the manufacturers, stone manufacturers, and they would say to me, we, we know that there's an issue, but what do we tell our customers that have been buying our product for the past 10 plus years? And my response to them was, well, what are you going to tell them five years from now when this technology is readily available and, and known? And it was just real happy to see that with the MVMA, they did at least make a point that drainage mats are an option when, when using the product. I mean, manufactured stone is a great product. I mean, there's no, there's no arguing that. Stucco has its advantages as well. It's just that, like anything else, they're porous. You need to make sure you have drainage behind these in order for them to succeed, to do well, and to keep growing. I'm involved in this group called BIMI, which stands for the Building Enclosure Moisture Management Institute. In July, it took three years, but in July, we got an ASTM number finally on engineered polymeric rain screen drainage mats. It's ASTM E2925. Our hope and goal is you're going to start seeing these products in the specifications that have to meet this ASTM. If you see a rain screen that has met this ASTM, that means it has passed the following tests. Heat aging, the nominal thickness test, immersion procedures, compression testing, short-term compression testing, the surface burning, drainage efficiency, obviously, and UV testing. One thing about drainage mats, unlike house wraps, you do not want to take your drainage mat and wrap the whole house with it and then put up your siding. Ideally, you want to put your drainage mat up while you're doing your siding. You can do it both ways. We do have testing that shows that it is UV resistant, but realistically, it's only going to be UV resistant for probably 90 days. Um, will the entangled filaments break down? No. What might happen is the filter fabric over time may delaminate a bit. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, the engineered rain screens that we just spoke about for a non-cavity wall application have actually now become specified on the commercial side of the business. We've got a product called Mortar Vent CW. The CW stands for cavity wall. But what we're finding is this is basically, with the Air Barrier Association and a lot of changes that have happened on the commercial side of business, this is pretty much the, the optimal way to build a cavity wall now. You've got your, your sheathing, your air barrier, rigid foam insulation is now being asked one inch or two inch, sometimes more. An all-wall drainage mat 
then you've got your brick, obviously, your through wall flashing, termination bars, and then your, your solvent or weep systems on the bottom. What this does, going back to how a rain screen works, allowing the air pressure on the outside of the wall to be as equal as possible with the air pressure on the inside of the wall, that airflow that is introduced is going to reduce the staining and efflorescence on commercial applications. It will protect against deterioration, obviously, of the interior finishes because moisture shouldn't be allowed to get all the way through. It will greatly help cut down on mold and rot. It will promote the indoor air quality, decrease the maintenance. Um, obviously, the less moisture you have on the building materials and the, the fasteners in the wall ties, the less possibility of corrosion. Now, one thing you'll see if you deal with the commercial side of the business, you shouldn't be installing a drainage mat the thickness of the intended airspace. In other words, if an architect is calling out for a one-inch airspace, you do not want a one-inch drainage mat. You want to have one that's probably 0.8 inches or three-quarters of an inch. The reason being, as you see with this picture here on the right, you need to have a place for the mason to put his hands to lay the brick. I've been on job sites where they've taken like a one and a quarter inch mat and squeezed it into a one inch airspace. That way they knew they had a nice tight fit. But the mason had a heck of a time trying to build the wall. This will work just as well as filling in that extra little void. And the reason I say that is this example right here. You've got the filter fabric. You've got the drainage channel. If the mortar gets stuck in between that little gap, the mortar, I mean, the moisture is going to build up. It's going to work its way through the fabric, and it's going to drain down. You have a guaranteed clear airspace. And, well, there aren't a lot of guarantees in anything, but when it comes to an uh, engineered rain screen with a filter fabric, this will be a guaranteed clear airspace. It allows the moisture to drain, not remain trapped in the wall. Another real important thing when it comes to engineered drainage mats is it allows you to shrink the cavity wall down to size. Now what I mean by that is, here's a typical detail of a 16 inch wide wall. You've got your air barrier, which is commonly specified now, your two inch rigid foam insulation, and now the architects are planning for a two, two and three quarter, sometimes three inch airspace to allow proper drainage. The problem with this is this wall system is getting wider and wider. It's also getting more and more expensive. It's allowing other types of products, other types of wall systems to all of a sudden become very attractive and very price competitive. Well, what you can do by taking an engineered rain screen drainage mat is you can basically have your air barrier, your flashings, your rigid foam insulation. Here's your, let's say, a 0.8 inch, or we actually have a 1.5 inch too, depending on how thick the airspace needs to be. But you can take your veneer and you can actually bring it up. You don't need to have that additional airspace anymore. Because keep in mind, this product right here is going to give you that guaranteed clear channel all the way to the bottom. So what's going to happen now is when that moisture comes down, it's going to drain in it's going to drain down and out of the wall. Now, as a, as a manufacturer of these products, it's easy for me to sit here and, and, and tell you guys this, but we actually went to the International Masonry Institute and said, listen, this is what we think is going to happen by using a drainage mat. Can you prove that we're right? And we, we've been working with those guys for a few years now, and they actually did publish a paper stating that using an all-wall drainage mat will, in fact, allow this building to perform and function as intended with a narrower cavity. Um, so much to the point that when, if you sit in on an International Masonry Institute presentation, they actually have this slide in their presentation now to show that this is not a sales pitch. This is actually true. This is theory. It has been tested. When you install these types of products on the commercial side now, you put your through wall flashing down. You want to put a termination bar over that flashing with a bead of sealant because if you don't do that, moisture can get behind that termination bar and possibly behind the flashing. Here's your air barrier, rigid foam insulation, and you'll notice, unlike the, the residential side that has a, a mortar vent which is 39 inches wide, these are 16 inches wide, and that's because they fit in between the wall ties. It makes it a lot easier for the contractor to install. As you know, with a 90 to 95% open weave, you can easily take a 39-inch version of this and poke it through the wall ties as well. But a lot of times, we want to take a product like this and make it as easy to install as possible. 
when you put this up, just like the, um, the mortar vent on residential applications, you want to use mastic or a sealant to spot it in place, or you can basically take the product and tuck it underneath the legs of these wall ties. Again, you only want to install the drainage mat as you're installing the masonry. And here's your weeps again, 24 inches on center, which we'll, we'll speak about in a second. If for some reason the, the all-wall drainage mat isn't what the architect wants, the way that it's been done for decades basically is using a through-wall flashing, a mortar deflection, your weeps, you know, your rigid foam insulation. So instead of going all the way up the wall, you're now going to basically just have a mortar diverter at the bottom or at all flashing locations. Okay. Very important when you're using a through-wall flashing that it goes through the wall. If you're using a copper or a stainless steel, it's UV resistant. So you can literally bring this flashing all the way through and flush with the face of the wall. If you're using a peel and stick, it's not UV resistant. So you want to bring it down, keep it back probably a quarter of an inch or so, have a drip edge, a stainless steel drip edge typically, so that that moisture can get all the way out of the wall. Many times I'll see contractors that'll buy a 5 ounce or a 7 ounce copper flashing, which is a very high end, very good quality flashing, but they don't bring it all the way through the wall. So what happens is the moisture comes down, it goes as far as the flashing does, and then it works its way back under the flashing and into the wall system. So remember, through wall flashing, it's called through wall for a reason. It's got to go through the wall. When you think of through-wall flashings, a lot of people think, okay, you got to put flashing at the base of the wall. Yes, but you also have to put it at any obstruction, window sills, window heads, doors, um, lintels, you know, at, at floor locations. Anywhere where there's an obstruction, you need to have flashing. When you have flashing, there should be a system involved. You should have a through-wall flashing, a mortar deflection, and you need to have a way to get the moisture out which is through a weep tube, a cell vent, or an open head joint. Advanced building products manufactures a wide variety of copper flashings. The most important one in today's building environment is this one here, Copper Seal Tie 2000. This is a product that Instone does have readily available. The advantage of this is it is a non-asphaltic, lightweight copper. When I say lightweight, it comes in either a 3-ounce thickness or a 5-ounce thickness. The advantage to using a non-asphaltic copper is it is compatible with all air barrier systems on the market that we know of, that we've tested to. Uh, it's also compatible with acrylic, silicone, urethane, and even mastic-based sealants. When you don't put asphalt on a product, it cuts down on the weight of the overall roll. So copper seal type, for example, we can put 60 lineal feet on a core. When you look at asphalt-coated flashings, they're heavier. We can only put 25 feet on a core. Obviously, the advantage when you're doing flashing is you want it to be as continuous as possible. You don't want to have any protrusions. You don't want to have many lap joints because that is an opportunity for moisture to get behind the flashing and into the wall. So this comes with 60 lineal feet, whereas its cousin, copper fabric flashing, is 25 lineal feet. Now, this product right here has been used in construction for over 100 years. It's a great product. Um, the only issue with this product in today's construction environment is it is not as compatible with air barrier systems. Now, the reason being is when you have an asphalt product in a roll form, we need to put parting agents on it during the manufacturing process. A lot of times, for instance, advanced building products put mica dust on our product. Some people put sand. Other people put mica dust as well. The problem is the mica dust is not compatible with the air barriers. So this type of product is very good and widely specified today on one, two, possibly three-story buildings. But if you're using a lightweight copper flashing, this is the one you want to use, Copper Seal Tight 2000. Um, we patented this back in 1999, and to our knowledge, there's really only two of us out there that have it. The other manufacturer that has it is because we were sister companies back when we patented it. So. You can't go wrong with either product. They're both very, very high quality products. And they do come with a life of the wall guarantee or 100 years. Um, very important for you guys to know, advanced building products, you know, we've been around for over 25 years, but a lot of our workers have been in this industry for 
40 years, 30 years, sometimes even 45 years. So all the products that we manufacture, the, the smallest warranty we have is a 50-year warranty, and that's on the mortar vent. And the only reason we did 50 years is because it's residential, and residential usually they don't care past 50 years. Whereas if you're building a hospital, a jail, a school, life of the wall is very important. One thing you'll find is with self-adhered membranes, no manufacturer of a self-adhered membrane is going to give you a life of the wall warranty or 100 years. They may give you 10, 15, 20 years max, but just be mindful of that. And when you use a peel and stick, and let's face it, they're used a lot, you want to use a termination bar and a drip edge. You already know why we need to use a drip edge, because it's not UV resistant. But peel and stick flashings will not, there's no guarantee they're going to stay stuck forever. So you want to make sure that you mechanically fasten this product in place. I've been on job sites before where if they put the peel and stick on and it's too cold, the, the product literally falls off the wall and it's down in the bottom of the cavity. So just make sure that you always, your customers, when they ask for a peel and stick, try to sell them on the turn bar, try to sell them on the drip edge, because really it should be sold as a package, because that's what you need. When you install through all flashings, there are many creative ways to do it, but there are only three recommended ways to do it. Using a turn bar, using a mortar joint right here, or if you have a poured concrete backup wall, you want to use a reglet. And the problem with this, which used to be kind of the, the tried and true way of installing a through wall flashing, is when you put it in the block backup, it stays in the wall while the wall is being built. So the wind, the UV, it, it's basically susceptible to a lot of damage. And if you're spending the money on a copper flashing, you really don't want to have to cut it out and replace it because it's been torn due to wind. Also, if you have an 18-inch wide flashing, let's say, and your measurements tell you this needs to go in a mortar joint one inch, but a contractor puts it in two Out briefly a few slides earlier. Here's a job in Pennsylvania that didn't use mortar deflection, had an awful lot of water problems and they couldn't figure out why. So we got on site, we ripped open the wall, and this is what we scraped away. difficulties, but since I can't hear anybody, I'm just going to keep going, and hopefully you guys can hear me. This job over here was in Kennebunk High School. This had to be replaced because they didn't use a mortar deflection. There was excess mortar buildup, and the moisture got behind the wall. Hey, Keith, I'm and sorry to cut you real quick. Your screen okay. is not showing right now, just so you know. Okay. Was it just showing recently, though? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Hold on one second. Yeah, yeah, get me back to um, your screen so we can do that if possible. Okay, I just saw something pop up on my screen saying there was some, oh, here we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Can you go back okay. two slides just in case? Yeah. Um, go back to number 49. 49. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'll just backtrack a little bit if, if we got lost or cut off. Um, from a flashing standpoint, when you install flashing, there are three ways to do it. You've got the turn bar, you've got a reglet for poured concrete, and you have a block backup. 
we highly recommend that you use the turn bar approach because it allows you to make sure that your flashing starts flush with the outside face of the brick and goes up as far as it needs to and then mechanically is fastened. This also allows you to put the flashing in place when you need it, not at the very beginning of the job where it can be allowed to blow in the wind, become damaged, and be susceptible to UV. That's one of the problems with block backup construction is that flashing is left exposed a lot longer than it needs to be. But more importantly, if you have an 18 inch wide flashing and you want to go in the wall one inch and the contractor accidentally puts it in two, two and a half inches, the flashing now is going to run short and it will not be flush with the face of the wall. The mortar deflection aspect that we spoke about briefly, this is a job in Pennsylvania that had a lot of moisture issues, so we had to go to the job site, open up the wall, and as you can see, this is a huge clump of mortar right here. You can also see how much we had to brush away right here. And anytime you have a wall like this, moisture is not going to have the way to get out because it's just jam-packed with mortar. This right here is a school in Kennebunk, Maine. It's a three-year-old school, and they had a bunch of windows that were leaking, and they could smell moisture and mildew issues in the wall. A lot of the parents were complaining because their kids were complaining. We got on the job, we opened up the wall and found that there was no mortar deflection being used and there was an awful lot of mortar buildup. The moisture was getting in at these locations into the wall system. So what we had to do was build special copper pans and use our mortar break mortar deflection and we replaced 350 windows because a mortar deflection was never used. This school, like I said, it was only three years old, so it's it can happen quick when it's not done correctly. Now, when it comes to mortar deflection, Advanced Building Products manufactures three types. All of these types are available through Instone. Our first one is mortar break. This is probably the second most specified mortar deflection on the market behind mortar net. This is also kind of known as the quote-unquote straight strip product. This has been on the market since 1989. Uh, we've never had a callback on it. I mean, it works very, very well. It's very cost competitive. Uh, it's made from recycled materials, so it qualifies for the lead points that a lot of these architects are looking for. We also have gotten into the designer mortar deflections. This one right here is a patented uh, mortar maze product that we have. It is a five foot long strip, and it breaks mortar up on multiple levels. Now, the nice thing about this product compared to all other mortar deflections on the market is it's interlocking. It's the only mortar deflection that you literally can take another piece and lay it on top and interlock so you have a continuous mortar deflection to go on top of your continuous flashing. Here's just a two inch version of it. We also have the dovetail that is so widely specified. Ours is called Mortar Break DT. The DT stands for dovetail. Um, same thing as a lot of the other dovetails that you've seen on the market, breaks um, mortar up on two different levels, and, and as a manufacturer of the straight strip, the dovetail, and the designer mortar maze, besides the interlocking ability of mortar maze, all three of these different types of mortar deflections are going to work the same. You know, I'd love to sit here and tell you that the dovetail is going to work better than the mortar break, that's why it's more money, but they don't. They all work the same. Um, this basically is just sometimes the shinier mousetrap must work better approach. A lot of the architects, if they see a design, they figure, well, that it must work better because there's a special design to it. It, it doesn't. They, they all work the same. So just, just be mindful of that. The cell vents or the wheat tubes, you may, saw those in some of the renderings that we had. Cell vents we highly recommend because this honeycomb approach allows a lot of area for moisture to exit. Wheat tubes are a little dicey because they can easily be tooled over when the mason tools the mortar joint. A lot of times they'll recommend 16 inches on center for the tubes, but 24 inches on center for the wheats. The reason being is just that. There's, it's a lot more difficult to, to have a problem with these, so you can put them every two feet. Whereas with the tubes, you want to put as many in a row as you can without it looking ridiculous, just to make sure you get proper drainage. From a cavity wall aspect, here's just a basic way to install your flashings, your mortar deflections at the base of a wall. Usually you put your flashing in a slurry of mortar. We manufacture preformed corners that are called copper corners. The unique part of our corner is that it's adjustable. As you saw, it's a two-piece. 
something that kind of confuses me as a manufacturer is we see a lot of people offering preformed corners, but it's just a bottom piece. When you have a flashing that's going all the way up the wall like this, you don't want a corner that's just going to be here because moisture is going to be able to get in behind right here. So you want to have a corner that is adjustable to always be the same height as your through-wall flashing. And again, with this application, you see a turn bar, you see your sealant, you see your mortar deflection, and your weeps. All of your flashing is through the wall and extended. This is a perfectly built for moisture protection wall system as far as we're concerned. External zones of moisture. When you look at where instone is located and where most of you on this call today are located, these areas in blue are where you have the most moisture. And kind of circling back to drainage mats, if you have an area that gets 20 inches of rainfall a year or more, you, it's highly recommended by building science, AIA, BIA, people of that nature, that you use some kind of a drainage mat or a drainage component. The real dark areas here are 60 inches of rainfall a year or more. And it might actually become code that 60 inches of rainfall areas are going to actually require a product like this. So you guys all know where you are. And if you fall in the blue area, it's, it's highly recommended to use some kind of a drainage mat in your building. One thing I didn't talk about, but I'll, I will very briefly, is the BIMI organization I'm involved in has rewritten the 2018 language to basically incorporate a drainage mat with one layer of house wrap. Right now, as you know, the code state two layers of grade D paper. Well, what we're trying to do is have one layer and then one layer of a drainage mat. We'll know in April if this language has been approved or not, but that is the direction that we're going in. Uh, states like Oregon, Minnesota are actually starting to adopt this already. So I, I, it's not a question of if. I think it's a question of just when. The Air Barrier Association with, with the, 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 the um, air barriers, you know, that started out in Massachusetts years ago. And slowly, by slowly, all the states are starting to adopt this. The people that run BIMI for us are the same ones that run ABBA. And we're trying to kind of copy and do the same approach. So I do think this is something that a couple of years from now, this will be the norm. When you're looking at rainfall, you also have to look at snow. I mean, areas right here, you know, 48 plus inches, you know, 24 inches, 36 inches, these are all areas of high moisture. When you have snow, snow is going to melt. When it's up against your walls, like we're looking at right now, you want to make sure that you've built your wall so that it can handle any moisture that's going to get through that, that veneer or through that, that siding or first line of defense. You also want to factor in wind, you know, coastal areas. As you can see here in the red, you know, this is a huge zone. I mean, it's a huge 250 mile an hour winds. I mean, you don't have 250 mile an hour winds, obviously. But these are the high, high wind areas all the way up and down the East Coast. If you take a 50 mile an hour wind and you have that exerted onto a wall, it creates six pounds of pressure. That six pounds of pressure is enough to allow moisture into the smallest of cracks in a wall system. So just kind of keep that in mind. You've got your rain, you've got your snow, you've got your wind. You've got to remember the vapor drive that we spoke about in areas like Texas and out west that you think, well, we don't have a whole lot of rain issues, but you do have vapor drive issues and solar drive that you have to think about. That is pretty much the end of the presentation, everybody. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, this is basically what InStone has available to you guys through advanced building products, the copper flashings, the peel and stick flashings, the termination bars, the weeps, either the mortar deflection or the all-wall commercial drainage products. On the residential side, the, the mortar vent, obviously, the, the rain screen. Um, we also have uh, weep screens that are available. I know InStone has a lot of residential flashings for you as well. So when it comes to moisture protection, InStone has a partner in advanced building products for anything that we make, they have access to, which means you all have access to. So if you have any questions, uh, by all means, you know, talk to Joey, talk to, to um, Kevin, talk to the sales force over at InStone. If you have any technical questions, feel free to call me anytime. Uh, any of my staff here is more than willing and capable to answer any questions that you have. One of the nice things about Advanced is when you call us with a question, we're not going to get back to you in a week. You'll get, a, you'll get an answer when you call because we have many people here that are qualified to do that for you.
advancedbuildingproducts.com. This is a very good place for you guys to go if you need data sheets, submittal sheets, if you want to know any MSDS um, concerns of products or lead sheets. All of our installation videos are there. Um, a presentation similar to this, but much more technical actually, is going to be on our website probably in the next month. That's going to basically allow you to go onto our website, press play, it's got an audio track to it, and you can sit there and listen to all of the different products that we have, but more importantly, more of the, the technical side of it. It's not a sales pitch, it's more of a technical presentation. We do have, for more event, an audio version of the installation instructions that teach you how to do this around windows, uh, corner locations. Uh, anything that you have a question about, if we don't have a video for it, we uh, will have a detail, a rendering, something that we can help you with. I really appreciate you guys. It's been about an hour. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but I, I do appreciate the opportunity to get together today and speak with all of you. If any of you have questions, um, I'm definitely open to answer them, or you can email me as well. I'm in the office for the rest of the week, so just let me know. Thanks, Joy. Thank you, Keith. I don't see anyone that has any questions as of now. If anyone does have any questions, once again, you can use the chat box or submit a question through the question section. And hopefully I didn't put you guys to sleep. <laughs> Not over here, at least. <laughs> Very interesting. This, um, Joey, just so you know, for any of your customers, this presentation, if they want it, I can email them a, a copy of it or I can mail them a copy of it if they needed it for for any reason. Some of our customers like to use the renderings and they play them at their facility for their sales force, for their customers that have walk-in business. So that is an option if anybody wants that. All right, perfect. So if anyone doesn't have any questions, Keith, thank you so much for doing this this morning. Absolutely. And have a great rest of your day. Enjoy All right, everything you learned. Thanks. Thank you.